Some of you all have met him before he came. I believe when we were over on the, uh, I think it was Obeson, what was it? Yeah, it was. So we're glad to have him and his, their children uh, with us this morning. So let's stand to our feet. Let's welcome the presence of the Lord into this place and let's see what God will have. How many of y'all came expecting the Lord to work with us? Lord, work with us this morning. Father, we thank you so much that you have given us this wonderful honor and opportunity to be in your house. We thank you, God, for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. And we thank you that you have woke us up this morning, that you have started us on our way, God. And we thank you for what you're getting ready to do in this house. Lord, as we know that there will be deliverance, there will be healing, God. Chains will be broken, yokes will be destroyed. The tightened binds will cut asunder, God, and captives will go free, Lord. We just pray, God, Lord, that your will would be done in this place, even as it is in the heavens, Lord. And for it, we're going to give unto you alone the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Saints, let's worship God.
Hallelujah. I don't know where I would be. Uh, the scripture said I'd be swallowed up. Amen. They call there nobody like him. Nobody Amen. Like I can keep on going. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Just one verse of this song. It's been birthing in my spirit. Amen. All night long and all, all morning, Brother Brian says, I don't feel no which time I come too far from where I started from. Nobody Father God, we thank you for what you have done just for all this morning. 
Now, God, we know that the best is yet to come because we know that the word straight from the plans of heaven, God. And I pray on this morning that we come with the anointing. And I pray that it come with power this morning, God. Bless those that are pressing their way out this morning, God. And those that are sick on this morning, laying in their bed this morning, I pray that you'll send your word, God, to heal them. In the mighty name of Jesus. And if any sick and feel me right now, God, before this service is over, God, I pray that you have touched them. In the mighty name of Jesus. Now, God, I pray right now that you bless the gift and the giver on this morning, God. And I pray that you'll return it back to them a hundredfold in this life. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen. Now, us are coming. I've got victory. And I believe that 
I believe that God is beginning to call a generation forward that will serve him. I really do, saints of God. And, 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 and they don't have to be uh, they don't have to be petted. They don't have to be placated to. They just want to serve God. Yeah. That's just it. I just want to serve Him. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that the facade of, of religion has created such a, 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 such a, 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 I don't want to say it. It's created such a, a, a neutral, such a bland taste in our mouths. Because we really need God's power. Yeah. It's not about just coming to church. And we thank God for that. And we know that we're not to forsake that. And we thank God for all of that. But if, if I come here and I go through the motions and it becomes mechanical to me, but I never experience the power of God, it has really profited me nothing other than to just, uh, other really than to just pacify my conscience and to tell, to, to allow me to tell myself that somehow I have, I have fulfilled my moral obligation and now I'm good. But how many of y'all know that God wants us to encounter his presence? God wants us to encounter his presence. In fact, at one point, Paul said, when I came to you, he said, uh, my preaching uh, was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but it was in demonstration of power of the Holy Ghost. In other words, what Paul was saying is, I didn't come uh, as the philosophers of his day to try to, to try to convince you to believe what I am saying. But he said, I came with power and demonstration. And as we talked about Wednesday night, God working with them, confirming the word with many signs following. I want you to go to me to Psalms 107. And, and we have we've went through this scripture before, but I'm going to just jump off this scripture quicker. Uh, 107 verse 17. The psalmist here said, fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. He said, listen, it is because of our own foolishness that we are afflicted. It is because of our own iniquity that we are afflicted. But verse uh, 18 says, their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. He said, then... They cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word, and he healed them, and delivered them from their destructions. Everybody say their destructions. Uh, he was not, uh, it, this was not happenstance. This was not just a roll of the dice that somehow destruction began to come to their life. But he says it's because they were fools. And because they were uh, engaging in iniquity, uh, that they uh, found themselves uh, in uh, being afflicted and in distress. But he said uh, they called to the Lord and he delivered them. Then he sent for this word and he healed them from their destructions. One thing that I love about God is he can even take what I mess up. And turn it around and work it for my good. He can take even what I have uh, brought about on my own self and turn it around and make it work for my good. But it doesn't come from, from, from me thinking and clicking my heels and somehow I come about to this place of, 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 of healing and deliverance. But it comes from the word of God. It comes when I turn from the mentality and from the direction yes. that I have found myself going in and I cry out to the Lord. Then he hears me. Yes. David said this poor man cried unto the Lord and he delivered me from all of my troubles. He said this poor man cried unto the Lord and he delivered me out of all my fears. Yes. We have the opportunity, saints of God, not just by the reading of this precious word, yes. but by the demonstration of the word of God to make manifest the great arm of God in a generation that has never seen it revealed. Yes. They have never seen the magnitude of the power of God that is going to be necessary for them to know that he really is God, yes. that he really has all power, that he really does sit high yes. and look low, that he really is the only true God, yes. that he really does have all power. 
They're going to have to see something. They can't just hear it. It's going to have to be something that they witness for themselves. And my prayer is today that whether you're sitting in this building or whether you're watching over live stream, that the word of God will touch your life and the power of that word will begin to be made manifest in your life and all of a sudden you'll be healed. You'll be delivered by the power of God. I think the church has walked away from that. The Pentecostal church has walked away from the demonstration of the power of God. Because we have succumbed to this idea that it looks weird, it looks strange, it looks abnormal. Well, to the flesh, anything godly looks strange. Let's say that again. To the flesh, anything godly looks strange. Uh, anything godly. In fact, uh, here come these uh, these about 120 out of the upper room on the day of Pentecost, and they come into the street. They spill out into the street, and they were they they were being they were manifesting in such a way that all of them that gathered around to watch them said, "These men are drunk with wine. There's something strange going on here. They're acting weird and strange." What I do not want to produce is a church where the flesh is comfortable. I want to produce a church where the power of God is so manifested in the church that the flesh has to take a back seat so that God can be magnified in the midst of the congregation of the saints. This is my desire. We have, we have children and grandchildren. We have spouses and loved ones that need to see God. They need to see the power of God. They need to see that you don't have to go through a 12-step program to be delivered from addiction. You can be delivered today by the power of God. That the same power that delivered them in the New Testament is still real. It's not lost its authority. It's not lost its intensity. But the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is in me. I told you there are things that I am tired of of watching boast himself in the church. I'm tired of watching sickness boast yeah. itself in the yeah. church. I'm tired of watching depression boast yeah. itself in the church. I'm tired of watching anxiety boast itself in the church. I'm tired of watching fear boast itself in the church. I'm tired of all this saints addiction boasting itself in the church. When greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, the church ought to be having the power to bring to We have so succumbed to the culture that now the church has become a self-help seminar. Mm -hmm. and, oh. and a moment of motivational speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, when you experience the power of God, no preacher is going to have to motivate you. Yes, right. Come, Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. When you really get the power of God on the yeah. inside of you, yeah. No preacher is going to have to serve as a psychologist because you can't get over your depression, because you can't get over your fear, and you can't get over your grief. But I'm telling you, children of God, there's still power in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That can bind up the brokenhearted. There's still power in the Holy Ghost to set at liberty them that are bruised. There's still power in the anointing to destroy every yoke. And we have to determine as a church what we're going to be. Are we going to be a lackadaisical sit back and do nothing church while the world goes to hell and while our children and our loved ones continue to stay in a constant struggle? Is that what we're going to be? Or are we going to be a church that rises up in this generation and say, Lord, we are willing to look strange enough to see the power of God made manifest in our generation. Lord, we're going to shout we're going to shout louder than before God. We're going to dance harder than before God. We're going to praise you greater than before God. Because I'm telling you, God doesn't inhabit the gathering of his people. He inhabits the praises of his people. And when God's people begin to praise him from the heart, I mean, lose track of everything around you. Get out of your personality, your stoic, sober personality. Hey, nobody need that right here. We don't need your stoic, sober personality. We need you to get outside yourself and bless the Lord like a child of God would bless the Lord. We need power. The power of God is in the presence of God. And the presence of God is in the praises of his people. We have to decide what church.
church we're going to be. We have to decide whether we're going to be a melancholy, lukewarm church that gathers together and just inhabits this place until he comes. Or we're going to have to be the church that is so hungry and thirsty for his presence that we'll praise him until he gets here. And then when he gets here, we'll say, Lord, nevertheless, not our will, but your will be done. That is what it's going to have to come down to. Some of y'all are so used to just standing around in church. But David said, I would that all get everywhere we pray. Lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Good God in heaven. We're going to have to get back to the power of Pentecost. We're going to have to get back to the power of praise. We're going to have to get back to the power of prayer. We're going to have to get back to the power of worship. There are people that are entrapped by their own situations, their own decisions, their own circumstances. But I'm telling you, I still serve a God that has power to deliver them. I said, don't take all that. It has for years. It has from the inception of the church. So don't tell me now because it's you. It don't take all that. That's just you standing in the way. That's just your stubborn personality standing in the way. But if we really want to see God move, we're going to have to step out on the water. Even though we like the comfort of the ship, we're going to have to step out on the unknown. Even though we're comfortable with what we've always known. Peter said, I ain't going to stay here, boys. I'm going to go out and meet Jesus. They said, oh, no, we know the boat will float. But we ain't never seen nobody walk on water. See, that's the problem. You're still stuck in the boat because you like things done a comfortable way. You like the confinement of your own comfort zone. But if this church is ever going to step out on the water, if we're ever going to walk out of the unknown, if we're ever going to take dominion over what has taken dominion over us, we're going to have to get out of the boat of comfort and we're going to have to trust God out on the water. So I said, well, you understand, Pastor, we're old. Well, all you can do is sit there and wave your hand. Don't you sit there, down on your easy chair, and say, no, I've given my praise to God. I'm old now. I'm just going to sit here and watch. Don't come in here and watch. You can buy a ticket. This ain't a spectator sport. We don't need you to watch our play. We came in here to praise the Lord. And if you must sit, you ought to wave your hand while you're sitting. If you must sit, you ought to clap your hand. We get so comfortable that we forget that it's beyond us. That there are people out there that are broken. That are being held in bondage. And they're waiting for a church somewhere to rise up. To where the yoke can be destroyed off their life. To where they can find and encounter the true power of God. And somebody said, well, I like blessed quietness. Well, God doesn't. God doesn't. The only time I see silence in heaven is for about a half an hour. And that's in the book of Revelation. And that's during a time of horrible turmoil and trouble. Heaven ain't quiet. The throne of God ain't quiet. But there are seraphims and cherubims continually around the throne of God saying, Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of your glory. But we get in church and we get so sophisticated and refined. Do you know what the, do you know what the Pentecostal church is allowed to happen? We've allowed the Philistines to take the ark. Because we've had a corrupted priest system carry it into a war in which it had no power to help Come on, children of God. It had no power to assist them. Because corruption will not ever be assisted by the power of God. But at some point, children of God, we are going to have to come to the place where we say, oh, dear God, whatever it takes, would you let the glory come back? Whatever it takes, would you let the power of God come back? Whatever we got 
have to do, Lord, would you bring it back? And Lord, we don't have to do it through a systematic way of man's ideology and man's uh, understanding. But God, we just want your glory. And if that means, David, that you've got to take off what defines you, if that means that you've got to take off what refines you, and if that means that as the king of Israel, who is filled with pomp and circumstance, and who is filled, children of God, with all kinds of notoriety, if that means that you have to take off everything that makes you who you are, and begin to catch people the Lord with all your might, whatever it takes, God, that's what I am willing to do, because we have to get the glory back. The building ain't going to bring them in. The property ain't going to bring them in. Come on, the music ain't going to bring them in. Hallelujah, ability ain't going to bring them in. Programs won't bring them in. The only way for God to draw people is by His Spirit. By... Yeah. Yeah. Somebody tell them we need the power. We can't do this without God's power. We're just flesh, but we are more than able. And so what do we want to be? And this church is going to have to figure out what identity we have. I ain't speaking nothing against our Baptist brothers and sisters, but we ain't. We are spirit-filled, Pentecostal people who worship in liberty. Amen. Amen. Listen, if we stop doing that to gain them, we have been converted. Yeah. Amen. I'm not looking to be converted. Yeah. I'm looking to show forth the power of God that people might know that there is true power with God. Yeah. And it's not something that was held up on the day of Pentecost and then died there. Yeah. But my God, Peter said this promise is not only unto you, but it is unto your children. He said, and it is unto them who are afar. He said, as many as the Lord our God shall call. This Holy Ghost I have. This power from the common that dwells on the inside of this earthly vessel. It is not dead. It is not dormant. And it didn't go to sleep after Pentecost. But the same power that turned the world upside down in the New Testament, it still resides on planet Earth. The last time I checked, people are still being filled with the Holy Ghost. Bodies are still being healed. Minds are still being regulated. Bondages are still being broken. The church started to implement programs when it started losing the power. Wow. Hallelujah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Back in the 20s and in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, those were years of rebellion. Addiction began to come into this country. Men were alcoholics. Drugs began to wreak havoc over young people. But I'm going to tell you there were still churches that had power and they didn't need programs to pull you through, but they had power with God. And when you walked into their sanctuaries, good God in heaven, that bondage was broken off your life. That sin was eradicated and you were set free. But now we've lost so much power with God that we are implementing programs to replace the power. But I don't care how thoughtful the program, I don't care how insightful the curriculum, if we don't have God's power, it is not going to be performed in our generation. Nobody's going free. Nobody's going to be healed. Nobody's going to be delivered. Because it is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Somebody look at your neighbor, tell them it's going to take the Holy Ghost. It's going to take the Holy Ghost. I'm ready to get back to the Holy Ghost. I'm ready to see God begin to shake sinners under conviction. I'm ready. Is there anybody in here ready to go with me? Oh, hallelujah. And now the church has become so refined. There's nothing wrong with being excellent. There's nothing wrong with having an excellent spirit. If you want to be like God, you must be excellent. Yeah. You must have an excellent spirit. Right. But I'm going to tell you, children of God, what we cannot do is become so, become so refined that we become stagnant. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. 
to where everything is in such place and order and structure and everything is just here and every T is crossed. Sometimes what you think is a T is an I and so many times what you think is an I is a T. And if we're not careful, if we don't let the spirit of the Lord have its way, we're going to cross what needs to be dotted or dot what needs to be crossed. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Why don't we just let the Holy Ghost do what it's going to do? Why don't we let God work with us? The Lord is still on the throne. Look at somebody tell him God is still on the throne. He's not lost any power. He's not lost any authority. He's not lost his saints. He's still on the throne. He's still God. Nobody has replaced him. Thousands have come, but he's still God. Many false gods have appeared, but he's still God. He's still high and mighty. He is still over all, above all, and in you all. He's still the almighty God. And if we're not careful, we'll become so worried. We'll become so refined. We'll become so detailed that God will be removed from the church and be replaced by an ideological disposition of an incapable man or ministry. We can't have this. Thanks God, maybe you don't have any children you're worried about being saved. Maybe your household's all good. Yeah. Maybe you don't have no loved ones that need to be delivered. Come on. Everything's good for you. Yeah. But it's not good for my house. I got children that need to be delivered from this world. From the power of this darkness. Yeah. And I'm up to here hearing, well, you know, New Destiny, you can't, young people can't, you can't reach young people at New Destiny. The devil is alive. Oh, the devil is alive. Amen. But I'm not going to bring in Super Mario Brothers to pull them into the church. I want to bring in the supernatural. I want to bring in the Holy Ghost. Listen, there ain't no way you can walk into the doors of this church and not feel the power of God. That's what's going to change them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because after the smoke and, and, and the mirrors are all removed and the entertainment value of the modern church is all subsided, what do they have? They still have themselves where they were when they first walked into the door. The devil is a liar. We used to say you won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Pound, oppressed, tormented, sick or lame for the Holy Ghost of Acts is still the same. Is there anybody but these people can walk in one way and leave another? I do. Maybe you don't, but I still believe God has the power to instantaneously change the heart of a man until he comes in an act, but he leaves free. Until he comes in depressed, but he leaves with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Till he comes in with a family, he turns it upside down, and he leaves with laughter and mirth. We're going to have a church that wants it. Right. Right. One that is far more than just saying it. Right. We're going to have to put the work into our work. Yeah. I'm going to say that again. We're going to have to put the work yeah. into our work. Yeah. That means when I come in here, I don't sit contemplatively and think of God's goodness. While worship is supposed to be taking place. I sit with my hands in the air. Somebody said, well, everybody worships differently, Pastor Jerry. There are about 120 in the upper room. All with one mind, one accord. And so, somebody said, I, I don't understand why everybody has to worship their hands because God told us to. That's right. I don't have to understand what God says. I just have to obey. Amen. See, some of us want to know why. Why do I do it? Look at your name and tell them, God said so. That's why. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. Because God said so. That's why. Oh, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Cry loud and spare not. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Come on, somebody. Well, well, come on, lift up your voice in the sanctuary and bless his I don't know why he wants that, but that's what he wants. So you know what my job? My job is to give God what he wants. Somebody say give him what he wants. If we'll give him what he wants, he'll give us what we need. That's how the exchange works. If you give him the praise he desires, he will give you the need that you have. He'll deliver you. He'll heal you because your deliverance is in his word. Because his word instructs. 
touch you to praise you. Come on. Right. Yeah. So we have to put work into what he wants. Yeah. When they when they were when they were uh, beginning to uh, sanctify Solomon's temple, they were setting it apart. They were establishing it as the place where the presence of God dwells. Solomon lifted up his voice and offered prayer. Yeah, yeah. Trumpets begin to sound. Yeah. Singers begin to sing. Yeah. The people begin to worship God. Yeah. And all of a sudden, yeah. woo, all of a sudden out of the heavens came yeah. a smoke and mist. Yeah. As the Shekinah glory of God began to enter yeah. into the house of God. Yeah. And began to enter into the assembly of the congregation. So that people began to lay prostrate before the Lord. And they began to worship. And the glory of the Lord was so profoundly in the house of God that the priest could not even stand to minister. There was such a move of God taking place that even the preacher couldn't do his job. Because where the glory of the Lord is, nobody has to work. Oh, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. You may be playing, but you're not working. Right. You may be singing, but you're not working. Right. The labor comes in yeah. when you're having to do it yeah. to replace the glory of God. Right. When you're having to perform to replace the presence of God. Yeah. When you're having to emotionally incite people as a replacement or a substitute for the real presence of God. Yeah. But when you get the glory of the Lord in the eyes, we may be singing, but it's sometimes I wish y'all could get yourself right here while we're up here worshiping. Because some of y'all look like you ain't feeling nothing. But if you could be right here when the worship is going on, my God, it, it, it almost makes you want to run. It, it really does. It makes you want to jump off this thing and come out and shake you and say, come on, what's wrong with you? Wake up! Because you can be in the place of his presence and never see something. Amen. My Aunt Barbara got here. She's a double lung transplant. But I can remember when she had her former lungs and her lungs were filling up with scar tissue. I could walk into her hospital room and breathe fine while she was gasping for air. It wasn't that there was a lack of oxygen in the room. It's just she couldn't receive it. Right. It's not that there's an absence of the presence of God in the church. It's just can you receive it? Right. Can you feel it? Amen. Can you react to it? Can you process it? How in the world do I process the glory of God? Do like Sister Chandra did this morning. Get yourself out of your seat. Come to this front and begin to worship the Lord. Amen. You're not going to get nothing in the boat. Amen. You know, I hear a lot of preachers say, dog Peter, man. I mean, that dog is bad. Yeah, yeah. They sit there and say, well, praise God. Peter got out there and started looking around at the others. And when he stuck his eyes on Jesus, he began to sink. And everybody talks about Peter's failure. Right. But he is the only one that walked on water. Because he was the only one willing to leave the known for the unknown. Amen. To leave the comfortable. Yes, come on. To walk on something yes. impossible. Yes. Your destiny, where, where are you at in your heart? Are you willing to leave what is comfortable? To go out and put your feet on the impossible? Yes. Are you willing to leave the known for the unknown. Are you willing to go beyond yourself? Somebody said, well, who am I to lay hands on the sick and they recover? I am a child of God. Well, who am I to cast out demons? I am a child of God. Well, who am I to see miracles and wonders. Who are you? Child of God. 
There's like one person in here that actually believes that. I said, who are you? If you're the child of God, then anything the Son of God can do, you can do. Jesus said, my power I leave unto you. What power, Lord? He said, all power in heaven and in But when we sit down in the seat of the familiar and comfortable, we say, you know, I know pastors saying we should do this, but that's just really not my personality. And my personality is subdued and reserved. And you know, I kind of worship God. Right. You're on your lazy boy Amen. with the stool kicked out. Amen. Is what you are. Mm. You think it's comfortable for me to do what I do? It's not about comfortable. This is what God has asked of me. Amen. This is what the Lord has asked of me. Yeah. And so I put in the work to give him what he wants because I need him to meet me here. Amen. I need him to meet you here. His word still has power, children of God. Amen. And we're going to receive that power. We're going to continue to resist it. When, when Stephen was standing before that uh, ruling religious council, he said, you stiff neck uncircumcised in heart and in mind. Yeah. He said, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. Yeah. He said, even as your fathers did, yeah. so do you. Yeah. He said, in other words, the power of God is right here. What more do you want? But he said, just like your fathers, you resist the power. Yeah. And then the writer goes on to say, you can have a form of godliness, but then deny power. Yeah. And children of God, the deliverance is not in the form. Right. It's in the power. Right. The deliverance is not in the fashion. Right. It's in the power. Yeah. The deliverance is not in the mechanical uh, movement of the church. It is in the power. Right. And what we have to ask ourselves is, do we want tradition of power? Do we want mechanical operation of power? Do we want form and fashion, or do we want power? What do we want? Because we could be the most traditional religious church on the planet. We could have all the bells and the whistles of the modern church. We could do it all, and it would be wonderful. But saints of God, I don't see people get delivered out of that. I don't see people getting healed. The only way we're going to get there is through the power of God. Through the power of God. God, I need his power. I need his power so profoundly that my children cannot resist it. That they can't stay neutral in his presence. That they can't stay neutral in his anointing. I need, I need a church that's so powerful that when my children encounter the people of that ministry, that the power of their life is so profound that it convicts them where they stand. That's the kind of people that I want to work with, that I want to walk with, that I want to serve God with. I want to serve God with people that are walking with God. Because if I'm walking with God and you're not, how can two walk together say they be agreed? At some point, we're going to have to hunger for it enough that we seek it until we find it. Isn't that what the scripture says? It said, ask and you shall receive, knock and the door shall be open unto you, seek and you shall find. But I'm going to tell you, children of God, we're going to have to seek until we find. We're going to have to knock till it opens. We're going to have to ask until we receive. Because this generation has never run. I'm talking about my children's generation. They have never seen the power of the Pentecostal church ever in their life. Yeah. We are almost a full generation from the power of the Pentecostal church. Because the Pentecostal church was exploding, the power of God was being made manifest in it. But somewhere along the line, we allowed the enemy come in to deceive us that, well... This is actually what it takes. If you'll put this program in, if you'll change this about your sanctuaries, if you'll if you'll take the cross down, if you'll quit preaching about the blood so much, and if, if you'll just really begin to speak to people's daily issues, and if you'll begin to give them the five points of the palm and kiss them in the mouth when they leave, if you'll do all of these things, then the church will grow to even greater uh, heights than it has ever before. And you know what that did to us? It diluted us. It took our power. And it made us, it made us powerless in the presence of the enemy. And so that the enemy could come in and just rip our children out of the church. 
The enemy can come into our children's heart and just take the truth out of them. The enemy can take children that we brought to the altar and we dedicated before the Lord and remove that covenant. Push them out into an ungodly world. To the point, listen, I've, I've not always been perfect. When I was a younger man, I did things that I should have done. But my God, it would eat me up. Conviction would overwhelm me to the point that I couldn't stand myself. But now our kids are, they're just out there just frolicking. Fancy free, no conviction. And if they're under conviction, they're hiding it really well. But when you have a church that has power, conviction cannot be hidden. It will draw people. They'll come here not knowing how they got here. They'll be driving by and the Holy Ghost will touch them and say, pull in there and go in there. You say, I don't believe that. That's how it's always been. That's how it's been for generations of Pentecost. Somewhere along the line, that, that power has been so diluted. And you know what it really is? We have become so accustomed to entertainment, to comfort, Instead of us filling our minds with the word of God, we're filling our minds with television. Instead of us filling our hearts with the songs of the Lord, we're filling our hearts with worldliness, ungodliness. We have lost the power of Pentecost because we want to straddle the fence of holiness. I'm going to say that again, saints of God. We have lost the power of Pentecost because we want to straddle the fence of holiness. We want God to come around to our way of thinking. But the only way for God's people to ever come back to the power they had is for us to stay at that altar until God says, nope, that's got to go. Nope, that has to leave. Nope, you got to get that out. No, you can't have that in your house anymore. No, you have to stop listening to that. Those old saints had power with God because they were willing to do it God's way. They were not asking God to come around to their way of thinking. I want to do it his way, saints. I, I put a post out the other day on Facebook. I said, I have come to understand in serving God that it comes to very little sacrifice personally because everything I have to offer him, he gave it to me in the first place. He gave it to me in the first place. Children of God, what do you have to offer to him but what he already gave you? So while we're sitting here thinking, God, this is going to cost me so much, all he's asking is for what he gave you. He's asking for your hands to worship him because he gave you your hands. He's asking you for your feet to praise him because he gave you your feet. He's asking you for your mouth to exalt him, but he is the one who made your mouth. Come on, somebody. What could you give him that he has not given to you already? So really, child of God, when you're sitting there loathing the sacrifice, what is it that you have that God requires that was not his first? Whatever it takes. Saints of God, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. Whatever it takes. When I see young men like Andrew here today, I've been praying for Andrew for several weeks since we talked last yes. that I would see him here in this church yes. I wanted to see him sitting in this church because he needs the power of God to just move over his yes. life yes. but he's not the only one in his age category that no. needs the Lord to move Amen. but this church is going to have to be powerful enough that we see people like Andrew come in and lay their head on the pew and yes. begin to weep under the power of God that has to return yes. Back to the church. And it's coming because there are people in here saying, Lord, whatever it takes. Whatever I have to give up, whatever I have to let go of, whatever relationship I have to walk away from, whatever is hindering me from touching you, I am willing to let it go. Because, Lord, you can take everything I have, but as David said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Whatever you require is not any near the value of the Holy Ghost. Lord, whatever I have to let go, it will mean nothing if I can hold on to the Holy Ghost. If I can grasp the power of God. 
God, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. So take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak to me because, God, I'm available to you. I can't walk without you. I can't live without you. I can't do anything without you. I told Chandra, I said, you know, when I was younger in the ministry, I thought that I had a good idea. I thought I had the plan that was going to make everything work. But God has beat on me enough and allowed me to make one stupid decision after another and suffer the consequences of that until I have come to the place where I'm like, Lord, I can't do this without you. God, if you don't get involved in this, I'd rather just not do it. Because, Lord, I'm not smart enough. I'm not wise enough. I'm not intelligent enough. I'm not powerful enough. I'm not eloquent enough. I'm not gifted enough. I'm not talented enough. God, I don't have enough to get this done. But Lord, if you'll work with me, if you'll get involved in this situation, then I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so that I will not receive only any of the glory at all, but as David said, that thy name and that thy name only might receive the glory. Saints of God, it's not about Jared's personality. It's not about me being put up in lights or on billboards or in magazines or on flyers. I don't care nothing about that. All of that is vanity in the first place. But if Jesus will walk in the midst of this place, I'll gladly take a back seat. I'll gladly people never know my name, but if Jesus can come in here and walk down the aisles of this church and walk through the pews of this place and touch people into the mighty chain, I'll gladly do nothing. I'll gladly do nothing at all. I'm not being dramatic. I'm not trying to put on a show. I'm telling you, saints, that is my heartbeat. I'm watching a generation go to hell in a handbasket, and the church on its own does not have the power to bring deliverance to them. But if God will work with us, if Jesus will get involved. I told Sean last night, I said, you know, we haven't had a long time since we're fine. We haven't had a revival in a long time. And I'm not talking about a night of services. I'm talking about with the glory of the Lord. I'm talking about an awakening with the power of God. Listen, I don't want people coming in here not filled with the Holy Ghost and leaving not filled with the Holy Ghost. What's the point of that? What's the point of being, that, of being a Pentecostal spirit-filled church when people can come in without it and leave without it? I want the power of God to be so profound that while I'm preaching, the Holy Ghost falls on somebody and they begin to speak in other tongues. Is that not what happened to the apostles? The Bible said that while Peter was speaking unto them, the Holy Ghost fell on them and they all began to speak in other tongues. Listen, God is no respecter of persons, but my God, he is there to work with anybody in any generation that fears him and walks with him. So children of God, I thank God for the stories I hear of my grandparents and my, my parents, and I thank God for all of the manifestations of the glory of God that have taken place in their generation. And I don't begrudge that. I don't envy it. I'm not jealous of it. As a fact, I praise God for every bit of it. But what about mine? Mm. What about mine? I don't want to have to live off their testimony. God, I want one of my own. I want to walk into this church and just walk in one day and just see people waiting at the door. Can't, just can't wait for somebody to open up the door because they can't wait to get into the house of God to begin to worship God together because somebody's going to get healed. Somebody's going to get delivered. Somebody's chains are going to be broken off their life. I want to see people coming from all backgrounds and nationalities. I want to see people come from all economic and social identities. I want to see people come in here that are Bud Buddhist and Muslim and that have all kinds of religious affiliations and walk in here and see that there is only one name given unto man by which we must be saved. And that is the name of Jesus. I am tired of watching the enemy win. When we are more than conquerors. When we are supposed to be victorious. And somebody said, well, pastor, you know, I just don't want to get into emotionalism. I mean, you provide whatever excuse you think is necessary for you never to have to be uncomfortable. 
But every day it's cool. Right. But Brother Joe, I got children. Person, me. I have children that if they don't get to the altar and get their life right with the Lord, if they die tonight, they're going to be a wreck of fire. And I know it. I know it. You say, you, I can't believe you would talk about your children like that. I don't know too much to act stupid. Amen. Love doesn't make me stupid. Right. Love actually makes me more passionate about the fact that somehow, someway, the power of God has got to get to my children. Some people say, well, you think God's like that? I mean, think about how much you love your children. Don't you love your children? It's not about that. You're equating emotionalism, God's human emotion, that fickle love. Oh, but I love, listen, God is just as much as he is love. Right. And God's justice has to be maintained right. in the middle of his love. Right. You think God's going to not love people he has to throw in the lake of fire? Mm -hmm. He will have loved them. God so loved the world. But justice, his righteousness demands justice. His love has provided mercy. But once his mercy can no longer stand, his justice comes into power. And after we have died, it, we now fall into the arms of what is just. Because all through our life, he was giving mercy. Yeah. Our children don't even know that. They think that I can do whatever I want, live like hell, go wherever I want, say whatever I want, engage whatever I want, and because of grace, I'm going to be saved. There's nothing that says that in the scripture. Right, right. That is a false it, I don't even call it theology because it's not theology because it's not in the scripture. It's an ideology. It's a false ideology that's been made, from, that has been promoted in the church as theology. Follow peace with all men and holiness after the which no man There has to be a work done in our lives and in our children's lives and everything they're pursuing outside of God they're running into one failure after another. One destruction after another. Somebody's got to raise up and say, look, God loves you enough to tell you you're being real stupid right now. Amen. To tell you that you're on the path of total destruction. Yeah. Because of your sins and your iniquities, you are in affliction. Right, right. But if you will cry to the Lord, yeah. he will hear you out of sight. Yeah. And he will send for this word. And he'll heal you and he'll deliver you out of your destruction. Church, I can't take another weekend of just being at the church. We've got to have God do something. I mean, people say, well, there are churches all over the place gathering young people. I've been in some of those churches. And I'm going to tell you, there's a difference in gathering them and them actually being converted. Amen. A lot of them are members of the church, but they are not converted to Christ. Yeah. They are caught up in the fellowship. Yeah. They are not yet born again. Yeah. And just because you come to the altar and say some sinners pray and get baptized means nothing. Unless you understand how awful and wicked and depraved and ungodly that you are, and that without the substitution and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, you are damned for eternity. But because there is that substitution, I can now come as a total flea, as a complete image, and I can come to the altar, and I can ask this great Savior to redeem me and to forgive me of my sin, and I know with full assurance that when I confess my sin, he faithful and just to forgive me of sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness and I know because I have understood the gospel that if I repent I need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins and that I have now access to receive the Holy Ghost. Children of God most Christians don't understand on that level. 
They think, well, I don't have the offer. I said this in a prayer. I'm good to go. They don't understand it's beyond the mechanical act of the altar. This is a work of the heart. And that's why the reason why a lot of preachers have to get up in their pulpit every Sunday and preach a convicting message that brings the same people to the altar. Because though they come to the altar, they've never been changed. Though they come to say a sinner's prayer, they have never been converted. They have never, ever felt the redemptive work of Calvary. Because I'm going to tell you, when you encounter God, you change. Ain't a person can touch God and go back the same. You touch the power of God, you'll change. You may not leave here perfect, but you'll leave here changed. I came to challenge this church this morning. And I came to challenge all of us that are gathered. What shall we do from here? Shall we continue to just try to figure this thing out when we already have the answer? What is there to figure out? I told, I told Charlie last night as we were talking, I said, you know, sometimes I feel so inadequate and I feel like I just don't have the answer. But then I'm reminded that Christ is more than sufficient right. to do the work. All he's asking me to be is involved. And then I went, well, maybe that's the answer. We have the answer. We don't need to keep asking the question. The answer is in the Holy Ghost. The answer is in the power of God. The answer is in the manifest presence of the Almighty God. I want to see this church filled with people who have need to be changed. Who are broken. Who are beaten. I don't, I'm so tired of watching those people go to a church and sit in a pew and listen to a preacher pacify their conscience. Instead of pricking until they run to the altar and say, God, here I am, a sinner. Lord, forgive me. Every Sunday they're running into churches where they're preaching a pseudo love that absolutely does not even compare to the true love of God. Because the true love of God, it, the true love of God will receive you as you are, but it will not leave you as you are. It is not satisfied for you to stay as you are. It doesn't sit there and say, I know you're a fornicator, but I love you so much. I know you're an adulterer, but I love you. I know you're a liar and a thief and a backbiter and a gossip, but oh, I just love you. I just mind. That's not how it works. He says, I love you so much. You'll never be that again. I love you so much that I'll do the work until you change. I love you so much until you don't look like that man anymore. But when you look in the mirror, you see me. I love you so much that I will break you to remake you. I love you so much that I will bring you to heal you. I love you. Is there anybody really want to know his love? Because his love, it is not easy in the, in the beginning. His love is not easy for the flesh. But my God, after it has done its perfect work, it will yield forth the peaceable fruits of righteousness. And the image that was marred in the hand of the potter will once again be remade into an image that looks like the creator. Let your love fall on us. God so love is God love is so profound in sense that it's supposed to convict you. The Bible said it is the goodness of the Lord that leadeth to repentance. And he's so good to you. Is there anybody who think God's been good to you when you know you were really good to you? I mean, you were so far from deserving it. Have you ever just sat there and said, God, why do you keep being good to me? God, why do you care? I don't even care right now. I'm not even looking to serve you if you just keep blessing me. You know what he's doing? He said, with loving kindness will I draw you to the wells of salvation. That goodness was never supposed to be taken in advantage of so that you can continue in sin. That goodness was to convict you. It was to make you feel like, my God, why? Why? Who am I? Until you realize, God, you've been so good to me. I can't stay like this. I can't be this man. I got to serve you. How can I not serve someone who has been so good to someone who's been so undeserving? That is what his love was supposed to do. 
the love of the modern church pacified to remain unchanged. I don't want to be that church. I feel like God is getting ready. I keep telling you this. There's a move getting ready to happen to this church. God's moving right now. He's moving. And sometimes we don't understand God. You know, I, I don't. <laughs> like I told you beforehand, I don't always have to know why. I told you weeks ago, but Earl mentioned it, I think, last Sunday night. I don't have to feel good about God's word. Right. I don't. Right. If he said it, it's settled. Whether I feel good about it, whether I understand it, is immaterial. It's right. just what he said. And some of us are waiting to feel good about it. Mm. Look at your neighbor tell him, just go ahead and do it. Just you don't have to feel good about it, just do it. You don't have to know why, just go. You don't have to know why. Right. You don't have to understand. Right. Just go. Yeah. I want to see God move so desperately that I can't even know how to take it. Mm. And I'm so tired of trying to figure it out. As I have learned, I don't know what to do other than to just abide by the word of God. But in all of us, if we are to walk together, we must be agreed on the direction. And our direction must be holiness unto God. We must let righteousness reign over this place, not self-righteousness. But let the word of God and the love of God and the Holy Ghost so operate in our hearts until holiness is just the outcome. Children of God, this is where we are. God is going to undercut the house of cards. And people in churches that are being pacified even in a new God's going to cause that to crumble and crush. It can't keep bearing up under the weight. There's nothing holding it. At some point, something will happen that will be heavy enough that it'll crush that because it has no foundation. This must be the church that can go through heaven how long and still serve him, still press on, still go forward. I'm telling you, I'm not paying attention to the doubters. I'm not paying attention to the naysayers. Oh, young people, they can't, they can't grow there. Listen, every, you know, every young person has ever told me that. You know what they do? They go to churches where they can control the preacher. That's what they do. They go to churches where they can tell the preacher what they want to hear. Or they go to churches where the preacher's already telling them what they want to hear, and they're still in control. When you are in a place where you have no longer the control, you are in the house of God. Amen. You are standing right. at the gate of heaven. Amen. That's all I got this morning. Because words are not sufficient for what's going on in my heart. I've tried to explain my heart this morning the best I could to you. Because I'm starving for a move. I want to see him move, saints. My God, why do our children and our spouses and our Lord, why do they have to go into hell to come out? Why is it that why, whoever said it was necessary for our children to go into addiction and come back to the church so they can have a testimony? Why can't our children have the testimony that God has kept me in the church all my life? It is because we have glorified things that should, we should have grieved. We have magnified things that we should have mourned after. I was in, I'll say this and then I was in a youth meeting in, in, in a church in Florida. And I was supposed to preach the whole meeting. One meeting, they, one service, they opened it up for young people to testify. And it started out good. But then we had a real ugly trend. And these guys were standing up talking about their addiction. And it was sufficient to say I was an addict and God delivered me. Mm -hmm. 
but they were going into gross detail about how violent they were and about how this they were and how gangster they were and how you know what was going on? They were magnifying iniquity. Amen. They weren't giving a testimony. Right. And every person from that point moving forward up the ante a little bit harder. They were a little bit more violent. Mm. They were a little bit more iffy. They were a little bit more worse off. Mm. Until I saw young people in the church that I knew had been in church all their life. And I saw them just you could watch them be cast down in their heart because they had nothing. That's what that's what the enemy, through those obviously uneducated, ignorant youth, and I'm not saying that in a bad way. If you're ignorant, you're ignorant. He was telling the young people who had stayed in church that they had nothing. And so I stood up. And I said, I appreciate all y'all's testimony. That's great. I said, I've never, ever shot somebody. Right. I said, I ain't smoked as much as a blunt. I ain't never put a cigarette in my mouth. I've not snorted cocaine. I've not shot a heroin. Right. I ain't been a gangbanger. I said, you know what? I've been in church my whole life. I said, you may have a great testimony. That God delivered you and brought you back to the church. I said, I have a pretty good one myself. God kept me in the church. Sometimes we glorify this stuff to the point that people think, well, I, I mean, it's just natural. I have to leave church at some point, go raise hell, and then come back broken and beat up and with nothing left of myself so that God can start from ground zero and restore me. The devil is alive. I mean, the, I said the devil is alive. I'd rather see children of God come in the church and stay in the church, be raised in the church, grow up to be preachers in the church, than I would to have to pull them out of a crack house at 3 o'clock in the morning. I want to see our children saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, living for God. Thank God for all that other stuff. But it's not necessary. You can stay in the church. Look at somebody tell me you can stay in the church. Because we are kept by the power of God. You can stay here. You don't ever have to leave this place ever again and leave the church and walk out and do your own thing ever again. You don't ever have to do it again. God can keep you by his mighty power. His word can keep you by his mighty power. You don't have to pop another pill. You don't have to snort another powder. You don't have to drink another drop. Say to God, you ain't got to sleep with another woman. You ain't got to sleep with another man. You ain't got to do none of that junk. You ain't got to run to a honky tonk or a nightclub. You ain't got to do none of it. God can keep you by his power in the church. Woo! Is there anybody that can say in here by the grace of God, I'm not going back again. I'm not going back again. I refuse to return to the man. Just push it right 
like to face again. You'd be surprised how many times while I'm up here preaching to you, I have to fight off thoughts that I put under the blood a long time ago. I know God who has forgiven it, so who has forgotten it, so who's bringing it back to my mind? The enemy. I know it's under the blood. But who's bringing it back to my room? It's the enemy. It's time for you to tell the enemy to hell with you. I ain't got no more time for you. Get where you belong. I'm going on with God. You can just close your mouth because you may have a lot to say, but you ain't got nothing I want to hear. I am forgiven. I am a child of God. I am not a slave to sin. I am not a slave to iniquity. I don't have to go back to Egypt. I'd rather stay here, even if it's in the wilderness eating man, than to go back in chains, being bound to a taskmaster who only cares that I build his empire, but has no concern for me personally. But I don't love him because I knew him first. I love him talking about Jesus. Because he first loved me. It was not about initially what was I going to do for him. In the onset, it was always about what he had already done for me. <clears throat> maybe some of us in here fear just keeps gripping us like, I want to, I want to keep going, but maybe, maybe I can't hang here. Maybe I can't hold on to this. Stop the devil right now. Amen. You're not a slave to fear. You're not a slave to sin. You're a child of God. Amen. If you're in this place, I'm going to pray. I want you to come here. I want to pray with you. That God, the Bible said, perfect love casts out fear. And the Bible said that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. We're going to stop all this junk that keeps the people of God on a merry-go-round and a teeter-totter, in and out, in and out, in and out. It's time for all that to stop. We're going to be here. I'm staying here. I'm here for keeps. I'm going to serve the Lord. Amen. I'm going to serve the Lord. Yeah. If you're ready to make that serious declaration, I want you to run out the week and pray that God will give us the grace. The Bible said he will keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The Lord, even if I come to times where I'm shaking, the Lord is able to uphold me. The Lord is able to establish me. The Lord is able to stabilize me. God, he said, I will give my ch angels charge over you lest you trip on a stone. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we need you to work with us right now. I feel like you've been working with us this whole service. But Lord, right now, would you work with us one more time? Somebody's coming today saying, I'm not going back. I'm going to serve the Lord. It may come, it may come at, at, at a great cost as it pertains to the things of this flesh. But Lord, I'm giving nothing up that you have not already taken upon you. Lord, in the name of Jesus, there are those that are here, God, that are dealing with fear. The enemy of fear has gripped them that maybe they'll never get to the place God has for them. Maybe they can't get there. Maybe they've gone too far and done too much. But I pray that you would help them to see, God, that as long as there is breath in their body, there is hope for them. And they are children of God. And they are going to be what God called them to be. And they're going to do what God called them to do. I pray that in the name of Jesus. Lord, right now, let conviction, God, let it go from this pulpit all the way to the back pew until we all run and say we are children of the Most High God, and we're not going back. Lord, let it be done in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you're in this place and you're ready to make that declaration, I'm a child of God. I'm not going back. I'm moving forward. I'm going to do what God called me to do. I'm going to be what God called me to be. I'm coming for peace. I want you to come to this altar right now. We're going to pray. I want you to come. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. I want you to come right now. I'm coming for keeps. This time is real, Lord. I'm coming for keeps, Lord. I ain't going nowhere. I'm coming for keeps, Lord. I'm coming. It's real this time, Lord. I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer a slave. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave. I am a child of God. I am a child of God.